Alex. Uh, welcome uh, everyone for um, a new OpenSIPS uh, Summit um, edition. I think that's the fifth year in a row being in, uh, being in uh, Amsterdam and more or less we will, I think we're gonna be here for the next years also. We love this place and uh, besides the actual event it's also a lot of fun so why not. Um, yeah, uh, we already you got used with the idea of having in the very beginning of May the uh, OpenSIPS uh, Summit and uh, for us, coming from the developers uh, side, that become a kind of a really, really hard deadline because we, uh, you know, to have some new materials for you to present during the summit, okay, of course, we, we have to come up each year with a new OpenSIPS version. So we like it or not, before the summit, we also have to release some new version of, uh, of OpenSIP. So that's the uh, beginning of May. That's the hard deadline with uh, every uh, new major uh, release. This year, we had the 3.0 release. Uh, from our perspective, was, I would say, something new uh, in terms of uh, approach, something different that uh, than uh, what we uh, did um, so far, um, mainly because we choose to target something else than, uh, let's say, typical, you know, getting more and more and more um, uh, features. So, in OpenSIPS 3.0, we focused more uh, on, if I may call it, usability of open sips basically how we can make uh, people happier more relaxed and to feel on the safe side whenever they use um, open sips now it's time for a small uh, disclaimer uh, i'm not sure how many of you been especially let's say last year conference um, but uh, we have, uh, we have, let's say, some. Uh, uh, there were some preferences in showing uh, small animals during the presentations, like uh, some people with kitties, other with puppies, and so on. So I'm trying to move away from that, and I said, okay, this year I will do horses. So that's just a disclaimer. I'm not doing kitties. I'm just moving on uh, uh, horses. <laughs> so if I try to make some analogy between these nice animals and uh, and the OpenSIPS 3.0. Well, so far we already let's say uh, are, we already are aware of uh, how powerful uh, OpenSIPS is in terms of uh, the capacity, like throughput. Um, by the way, any idea like anyone doing tests, like how much traffic you can push? Yeah, I've just had. Several weeks ago, and we were trying to get with uh, 300 calls in a row. Uh, you said 300. Come on, you're insulting yes. both. <laughs> 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 okay, let's let's do a bidding. <laughs> Just to give uh, to give you some hints, um, so real life scenarios uh, they are like uh, maybe so production systems, maybe 5,000 calls per second, and a couple of 10, 20 uh, simultaneous calls. Uh, the, there's a bit of discrepancy between the numbers because you on that platform it's a lot of call center crap, uh, sorry, uh, traffic. Uh, so you know how it goes. Um, also, in terms of, uh, let's say, a kind of non-production tests, or lab kind of tests, uh, it's completely unrealistic. Nobody wants to go in that, but uh, we manage on a reasonable, so not something really fancy piece of hardware, to get around uh, 50,000 calls per second. But that's, that's something where, believe me, you know, you are running on the edge of, uh, how to say, uh, being... Uh, uh, stable and uh, safe. I mean, uh, that's that's an edge. You don't want to go there. Yes. We are running on 
open sys. We're running uh, between 1,000 simultaneous calls on a daily basis and around 1,000 caps. Okay. And That's that is production day to day. Yeah, for, for production, it's quite a good reasonable number, of course. It highly depends on what kind of service you have, because, you know, depending on your script and service, the actual service, uh, the throughput may be highly impacted. What but, hardware did you use to achieve, like, 15,000 calls per second? Does it depend on the other hardware? Or? Uh, well, definitely, uh, of, <coughs> course, of course, it was a quiet... Uh, um, uh, not, uh, I wouldn't say like uh, simple, but reasonable like config, config file with routing between endpoints, with dialogue support, accounting, something like that, but uh, uh, not uh, too complex in terms of being realistic for a production system. Uh, it was an uh, Intel server, like, uh, I don't remember, like uh, 12 cores, uh, something like 32 gigs of memory and something like that, because at that point, everything goes into CPU actually usage and how you um, uh, utilize all the resources. Actually, when we did that, uh, at that point, uh, during those uh, those tests, so we had that limitation in terms of, I mean, the actual shared memory became a bottleneck. And that was the point where we introduced that new memory allocator, the high performance memory allocator, which allows concurrent allocation, so it's not like a kind of a single locking uh, memory uh, allocator, but that was how uh, that new memory allocator came into uh, into OpenSIPs during those uh, tests. So that was really extreme kind of testing. We just pushed everything to the maximum just to see where we can get with these uh, numbers. Of course, nobody expects, expects probably not even closer on a, on a real system, but more or less it's what kind of brute force you have in uh, in uh, in uh, in OpenSIPs again as a throughput, and then uh, as a uh, number of uh, features. Uh, I think they are like I don't even I, I think I lost count. They are like uh, more than 150 modules offering different kind of uh, uh, features. Not to mention that combining everything in your script, how many scenarios you can actually implement. So basically, you have a lot of capacity, you have a lot of features, and you have the flexibility because of the script to do so many uh, scenarios. But the question is, are you actually able to be in, in control with all these? Because, you know, you put everything together. Of course, it's quite a lot of fight to make your, to learn, to make your script, to, put a, to make it work. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the question is, no, how do you manage it in real life operational, uh, from the operational perspective? Um, how um, easy is for you to understand how your platform is going? How easy is for you to, to operate, to perform changes and, uh, and so on? So the day-to-day, day-by-day activities in terms of maintaining and operating a an, uh, an, uh, service. And um, probably, any of you operating already OpenSIPS platforms, you will you will say, yeah, okay, we know we had problems and issues, for example, with the learning curve and how easy it is to understand the script and to use it. Then uh, uh, how easy or not is to, uh, in terms of operational, <coughs> again, to when something goes wrong, because that's the only uh, only times when you have this kind of a question, like, okay, what's actually going on, you know, to understand what's the problem. Because you just have a black box in front of you, not performing as expected, and the question is, okay, what's going on? How do I fix it? Um, uh, and also the regular, you know, changes. Everybody, like uh, any kind of DevOps engineer, the biggest nightmare is like, okay, I need to restart the service, you know. And you will do whatever it takes to try to avoid it because nobody wants interruptions. That means scheduling uh, maintenance windows, notifying your customers, blah, 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 expecting the unexpected, and so on. So short, uh, shortly, you don't want to go there. So yeah, there are a lot of risks yeah, when it comes to you know, uh, trying to, uh, let's say, controlling uh, uh, open ships. And that's why we said, well, let's take a bit of a different approach. Let's not 
focus so much on in 3.0 on uh, actual features like uh, newly added uh, features in terms of SIP routing and so on, but mainly in terms of making everything uh, more oops, controllable. I told you about controlling it. That's a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> when your horse get out of the stable? Yeah. <laughs> it ran too fast. Yeah. So at the end, we want a kind of a combination between power and control. That's that's the ideal uh, goal, and more or less that was the target for the 3.0. So to add a really powerful control layer on the OpenSIPS beast. Now. Let's see how we actually did that. So for the, as already said, we focused on the dev and ops uh, concept. And uh, more or less for the two things, uh, for the uh, development, the development in terms of develop, uh, developing services, not necessarily developing uh, code, um, we focused on how to make the scripting in uh, in OpenSIPS, uh, much easier. So basically, service development uh, based on OpenSIPS uh, much um, easier, because you know you have all these uh, issues. First, you have to understand how you have to configure how the script works, and then you have to go in all the dark corners of how you can actually make the script work with variables. What's the scope of the variable? Uh, different kind of routes, and so on and so on. So there are different. Uh, so, so many uh, bits and pieces that you have to understand and put together in order to uh, make it uh, work. So we said, okay, let's try to simplify as much as possible this kind of experience in terms of uh, developing the OpenSIPS uh, script. On the operational side, of course, everything reduces uh, to making, making it simpler and safer uh, to operate so safer in terms of the service availability to reduce the impact whenever you are on the service whenever you have to do changes to be able to understand what's going on with uh, uh, with your OpenSIPS uh, platform and to be able to um, um, monitor to troubleshoot in a very okay in an easier uh, way so let's look at the dev side in the very beginning. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, addition from our perspective, from, uh, from the script development perspective, was uh, adding the generic preprocessor uh, support in, um, uh, na na natively directly into the OpenSIPS uh, script. <coughs> There were long discussions, okay, if we need or not something like that, and okay, if we do need a uh, script preprocessor, then which one would be? And uh, we said, okay, it makes no sense to try to in reinvent the wheel and come up with our own uh, way of doing you know, the preprocessing, like uh, keywords for replacement, for include files and stuff like that, because you know, there are so many options available. So um, our approach was a bit different. Let's try to use whatever exists in terms of preprocessing and just to embed them directly into, uh, into OpenSIPS. And uh, this approach, besides you know, making, um, um, uh, uh, besides simplifying the approach on the problem, it also makes uh, people happy because most of, of most of you already use some, you know, your preferred preprocessor. It's either it's like a J2, either it's an M4 or whatever. You you already have something. Probably already do it before starting OpenSIP. So like a, a pre-service kind of uh, operation. So uh, we looked for an uh, option to again to make everybody happy. Especially that <coughs> such pre-processing affects not only OpenSIP. You have probably larger platforms with many other components. Maybe some automatic deployment systems where you already uh, use on a larger scale the whole pre-processing uh, system. So it's easier just to leverage everything with the same kind of uh, pre-processor. So basically, right now with, uh, with um, OpenSIPS, you can use theoretically 
any kind of uh, preprocessor. You, it's it's a uh, uh, common line uh, parameter saying, okay, that's the executable. Eventually, if you have some extra parameter depending on, on the preprocessor, and the OpenSIPs will do the actual, will run for you the preprocessor. And the cool thing about that is it will also take care and correlate the original script and the resulting script in terms of lines when reporting, let's say, parsing errors or reporting uh, different kind of issues uh, at runtime. So, uh, because that's, that's a common, at least from my experience, that's a common uh, issue. You have, let's say, uh, an M4 template apply different kind of uh, substitutions or whatever, it results a completely different file. And of course, OpenSIPs will operate with the resulting file and report any kind of errors with the resulting file. But then you have to correlate back with the M4 file because you apply changes only on the template. So that's a bit painful. Well, with the new preprocessing approach, you get rid of this uh, uh, pain because OpenSIPs will do the correlation, and you just have to work with only one file. That's the template file. That's it. End of uh, end of story. Nothing uh, complicated uh, anymore from this uh, perspective. And uh, just as a fun fact, as a preprocessor, you can use even SED with OpenSIPs if you like to. So if somebody is, let's say, geek enough to give it a try, it works. Um, Another thing that we did for the development uh, side was trying to come up uh, with a generic variable uh, support into the script, more specifically for the um, function uh, parameters. Probably if you used the scripting uh, in OpenSIPS, you, you know that before 3.0, you just have everything was kind of a string you now in terms of parameters, even if uh, logically speaking, the value, the parameter was, let's say, an integer, like a send reply 200. Okay, I mean, pretty obviously the 200 is a reply code, it's a number, but still you pass it with quotes. And then you have the uh, cases where you, uh, you are passing to a function some variable. And the question is, you never knew exactly, okay, am I passing the variable, the value of the variable? Or do I expect the function to use the variable to write something into it? So it was quite ambiguous in terms of okay, what's, uh, what's the purpose of that variable? Um, not to mention the biggest problem which actually was addressed was that probably only 20-30% of the functions in, in, uh, in OpenSIPS uh, um, uh, supported variables in their parameters because there was no generic support at the script level, it was more or less up to the actual function. So the function itself, the, its implementation was able or not to handle variables. So when we said, okay, let's do this in a generic way. So automatically, any kind of functions right now in 3.0, any functions uh, in, uh, in script can take uh, variables as a parameter. So there are no, uh, no any more no questions or documentation like, okay, this function does or not support or, um, um, what exactly has to be an integer or not? Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of issues. Not to mention from the code development. So for the people trying to write some uh, some new modules, everything simplified. So basically, we I think we got rid of like uh, 50k of lines of code just because you know we drop all this per function support if, uh, for the for the parameter uh, for the uh, variables, and actually we made only one layer directly into the script uh, interpreter. So that will simplify a lot. It will make the script more cleaner in, in terms of what exactly is the uh, type of the uh, parameters. And um, another, uh, uh, another thing that we did also in terms of standardization is the new management interface. Uh, basically, we decided um, to, to drop the so-called custom language or syntax, sorry, which were used for the FIFO and for the datagram uh, interface. And we align everything to the JSON because it's much, much easier to, to parse, especially if you want to integrate with uh, 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 external applications. So uh, right now, um, as a syntax, most of the backends do uh, talk uh, 
in terms of, again, syntax, uh, JSON. Of course, there is the exception of XML RPC, which cannot talk JSON, it talks XML, that's it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's uh, that's an, extent, uh, an exception. Um, so that was a really major rework because we separated what means syntax for the MI and what means the backend because you, we have right now JSON over the FIFO file, we have JSON uh, through the datagram, you have JSON uh, um, uh, via HTTP and so on. But at the end of the day, those are just transport. The content, it's all the time JSON, which is much easier to parse. Uh, and uh, and handled. Do you intend to keep XML interface long term? Um, well, it's there. It works. I mean, we we made an uh, basically uh, because OpenShift's core in terms of generating all the MI data, it's doing like a JSON object. The interface is doing it's it's a wrapper and doing doing a conversion from JSON to XML. We plan to use it. Uh, that's why we said, okay, let's make the effort and uh, handle this exception. Uh, so it would be there, yeah. We, there, is, there are no plan to retire it. We know there are XML lovers out there, so. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, because of this uh, standardization of uh, the MI interface, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit later, uh, we have a new uh, tool to, uh, to work with OpenShape. So basically the well-known old body, OpenShape CTL, it's more or less dead, uh, replaced by the oh. <laughs> replaced by the OpenShift CLI, which is uh, a completely new, uh, different approach. It's a CLI. It's uh, an interactive interface with a lot of goodies. We will. I don't want to do a spoiler. We have. A, we'll have a uh, uh, presentation about that. We'll have also a <laughs> demo in up to two days. So during the workshops. Um, yeah, so that was the OpenSIP CLI be part of the binary, but now it's separate, right? Uh, yeah, it's a separate, it's even a separate project right yeah. now. So, uh, and um, basically it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a Python. I'm not sure if we have yet a package uh, for it uh, in terms of distributing, uh, distributing it. Uh, uh, there was one of the, let's say, because we worked on so many things that somehow uh, uh, came together more or less at the end, like, okay, management interface changes in the code and writing the CLI tool, but on the CLI tool, we're going to see we have a diagnosis console and a tracing console and so on. So it was like a quite big challenge in trying to make everything fit together at the end. Um, this happened, this kind of emerging somewhere at the end, just before the release and uh, for the actual Let's say at the beta time, we had no time to prepare a packaging for it, but that would be taken care of in the next, uh, probably in the next uh, uh, weeks. Yeah, so uh, the, more, the most, uh, the more interesting part, the operational side. Uh, what do we have in, uh, in here? So I'm not sure if you remember, but um, when we announced the uh, plan for the 3.0, we had a kind of a uh, poll uh, trying to get a feedback like uh, what are the most uh, uh, demanded uh, features from the perspective, from the community perspective, and um, yeah, I'm trying to follow that uh, that order as much as possible in terms of uh, you know what people are looking for. One of those uh, was the so-called script reload and actually to be more precise it's routing script reload basically what this feature allows you is to change your routing logic and to reload it into open sips without any need of restarting the actual open sips and uh, probably how many of you actually do operate an open sips based system okay Okay, so yeah, so you, you know what I'm talking about in that case. So you need to do maybe some time, in most of the cases when you need, to do, uh, you need to do a restart right now, you just want to do some tiny changes. Maybe add an X log, maybe change some uh, small variable. So really tiny changes, but you need to do a restart. And restart, you think about, hey, I need to recache a lot of stuff. It takes time. Uh, 
uh, I will drop all the TCP connections and uh, okay that's that's an issue especially when you have netted uh, endpoints and so on so there are a lot of problems uh, derived from restarting even if the restart let's say it's it's a half a second or anything like that the harm it's done already just because you did the restart so you are really careful when it comes to such changes well with the script reload all of these are taken care you don't have to bother about losing traffic uh, losing connections or anything because you just um, reload the script with more or less uh, zero penalties I'm saying more or less with zero penalty because the only penalty that you can have there are situations where OpenSys may say you know what I don't want to actually reload if you want to use this new script, you actually have to restart. There are some incompatibilities be between how OpenSIP was initialized in the very beginning and the script. So if the new script that you are trying to reload, uh, you may end up in you know, being incompa incompatible with the way that OpenSIP actually started. Because again, it's not a full script reload. You are reloading only the routing uh, blocks. So if you add the function, let's say that it's doesn't exist because you haven't loaded in the very beginning the module that's it there is no way to do it you have to do a restart or if you uh, the par module parameters do let's say are incom incompatible with the new functions that you may you may push into the script in that case OpenSys may refuse and say no sorry it's not possible to use a new script so there are cases where uh, the script reload may be refused again between the because of this incompatibility with how the modules were loaded and initialized. Nevertheless, in uh, I would say that maybe in 80% of the cases, it's it's uh, it still solved the problem because in 80% of the cases, it's about small changes there and there. So um, you know, you just want to put an X log to do some tracing, or maybe you want to uh, put a new function or to change a condition or whatever. So in that in those cases, it will perfectly work so automatically that will reduce the number of restarts that actually you have to do on the uh, system um, another great thing is the auto scaling uh, support um, I have somewhere here Flavio oh yeah over there and yeah we are running the bootcamp uh, the open Boot bootcamp together and in in the first day, we have a chapter about explaining what are the you know the most common parameters, global parameters in OpenSIP. And we got to okay, you know, configuring the number of processes. And automatically, then there are like five to ten hands in the class saying, "Hey, what's the what's uh, how do you calculate the number of processes? What's the magic formula?" Mm. Uh, there is no magic formula. Sorry, guys. <laughs> It's just uh, you know trial and error stuff. You know, just see how it how the number of processes fits with the with what kind of uh, uh, logic and processing you have in your script, and then you just do adjusting. Adjusting meaning restarting, putting more processes. Well, taking out processes probably don't care so much about it, but usually putting more processes, and uh, that's a quite uh, tricky process because you have scenarios, uh, uh, yeah, systems where um, the load highly depends on the uh, time of day. So it's really, you know, big difference between, let's say, day and night. Or maybe you are slowly increasing and you don't want to restart, but you find out that maybe after like one, two months, three months, you have to because, you know, your initial assessment in terms of processes was uh, not correct and so on. Well, this auto scaling uh, solves this problem basically. It will let OpenSIPs to use uh, to actually to create and terminate processes depending on what's the actual load on the system. So there is a way for OpenSIPs to internally monitor its load for the UDP traffic, for TCP traffic, for timers, and so on. And depend depending on this load, it will create or eventually terminate new uh, processes on uh, Thursday there will be a uh, workshop on that so we see how it works how you can define uh, define a, an uh, auto scaling profile because you it's it's in terms of how it works is quite uh, similar with like in the in the monit if you are familiar with that telling okay if you get to some threshold in terms of flow then you have to spawn a new pr process or 
if load is less than for a number of cycles, then you can terminate the process and so on. And then OpenSIPS will simply take care. And uh, that's a great feature, especially for people running in clouds, where you know sometimes you pay per CPU cycles, so you really want to use the exact number of resources that you, you need. You don't want to use less or more. No. Uh, it's a nice and a very dangerous one, to be honest. <laughs> we thought about that. Uh, originally, uh, we said maybe we're going to add some MI command for that, uh, but uh, we ended up uh, with the conclusion that it, in terms of implementation and you know the whole logic behind that's that's very first dangerous and then very tricky to to do it <laughs> um, you know how people are you know with the warnings you just skip 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 <laughs> let's go to the funny stuff <laughs> so I don't believe in warnings <laughs> um, yeah, so I already mentioned the new OpenSIPS uh, CLI, which is a really new great experience in terms of uh, connecting and interacting with uh, OpenSIPS uh, remotely from a, uh, um, uh, from a command line interface. And um, besides the fact that this tool aligns with the new management interface and uh, you know it's much uh, nicer, you have tab completion, you have history in terms of what you did, you have some help and so on. Um, it also includes two new really cool tools. Um, one is the Diagnosis Console and the other one is Tracing Call the Console. Uh, diagnosis Console is, well, let's say it tries to be like a kind of a 42 answer, if you know what the 42 is, the answer to the ultimate question. Um, okay, you don't read too much books. <laughs> um, there are situations where, you know, some, sometimes things are start going wrong and you have no no idea why you know you see like calls not completing or whatever kind of a side effect but you have no idea what's going wrong into the system well the diagnosis tool it's something uh, that is able to help you with that because it hooks into open sips and gets a lot of uh, statistics thresholds and it's not like anything magic, but it tries to give you some hints, like, "Hey, guy, you know, you know, take a look. You have you start you, are, you, uh, you start having slow, I don't know, DNS query or slow DB operations, or uh, you are running out of memory or uh, different kind of things." So it looks to a lot of things into uh, logs and OpenSIP statistics and tries to give you a hint uh, in terms of what's going wrong or Going back to the auto scaling, it means hey, you need more processes, guy. <laughs> so um, that's a uh, again in terms of operational uh, from the operational perspective, it's a really great uh, tool because it's a very fast way to you know to understand what what is going wrong with the OpenSIP, so you can go and fix it quickly with a minimum penalty on on the service. Um, tracing console, it's. Um, it's more, um, let's say, addressing issues coming from the, let's say, user side. You know, like you need to trace something from a specific user, like traffic and logs. Well, that's what the tracing console wants to be. You know, you just define some filters in terms of maybe IP or user, like a caller, and then it will automatically feed into the console the SIP traffic and the open SIPs logs. So you get all the data related to those calls into the OpenSIPS uh, console so you can have a quick way of understanding you know eventually why some calls do not complete or you know uh, something like that right now the only way to do it okay you open do a do a tail on logs and open SN grep or whatever and try to put things together correlate uh, it's a bit of a mess so this this kind of tool will uh, will uh, will solve such problems again on Thursday we'll have a nice demo about both of them um, so, I will not do a uh, more spoiler on this. Yep. Are you using some elastic search or something for this tracing? Sorry, come again? Some elastic search kind of tool you are using for the log analysis? If we use a tool or? Elastic search kind of. Oh, uh, no. Basically, it's, it's, it's a real time. So, it's a real time data fetching from, uh, from OpenSIPS. 
you just again define something like uh, filters based on IP address, source IP of the traffic, or maybe user, uh, caller user, or something like that, and everything is in real time. So there is no storage at all. Everything in real time is dumped to the console. Uh, then we have the internal memory persistency during restarts. Um, how many of you do use the dynamic routing module? Okay. How many of you do have like 50, 100 millions rules in that? Okay, see one hand. Two hands. <laughs> Three. <laughs> okay. Well, um, this module uh, in particular, it's uh, caching all the data. It's not necessarily because of, uh, you know, avoiding the DB operation, but it's because it's restructuring uh, completely how the search is uh, it's done uh, in, in, the, in the data, in the prefix-based uh, uh, routing. So everything has to be loaded in the, into memory. And when you have like 10, 20, 30 million rules, well, this caching takes a lot. This caching, it's done for the whole uh, data chunk at the startup. So basically, even if your uh, OpenSIFS as application did start, that, load, that, that loading for the dynamic routing data, it's still ongoing somewhere in, in background. So it will not, you basically will not be able yet to run uh, or to route, sorry, anything based on, uh, on that uh, data, which is, you know, basically an issue when you do restart because, you know, you restart and then you may have like even minutes, depending on what's, uh, how large your data set is, well, the actual, let's say, PSTN routing is not available. So that's not something, that's not an option at the end of the day. You, you need to have your system up and running all the time. So um, basically this internal memory per system, what it's doing is saving some memory during restart. So even if you restart OpenSIPS, that data which was cached for, from the, by the dynamic routing, it's still persisting across the restart in uh, in memory. So when the OpenSIP starts again, it will bind to the existing memory and the whole data is there. There is no need to reload. It's in memory already. So that basically means no penalty in terms of uh, performing the service when you do the restart with the dynamic routing. So that's, that's a really cool thing because we had cases, uh, let's say, abusing a bit the dynamic routing for number portability lookups and you have like even 500 million records and it will take centuries to load all the crap in memory so you don't want to wait even 10 12 minutes because it depends a lot on the db uh, performance um because we talked about memory uh that's more for um i would say that's more for us interacting with you i mean us as a developer team interacting with you as the users uh, uh, the so-called selectable memory allocator. Um, there are reports, hey, my OpenSIF ran out of memory. Wow, okay, so we need to find out, okay, what's happening? Is it simply running out of memory? It's a memory leak and so on. So then we automatically have this kind of request from our side. Uh, okay, you need, the, uh, you need to compile with a special memory manager that it's able to trace such uh, potential memory leaks which means you, go, you have to go back and recompile the whole stuff. And if you install from packages, that's a problem because it's already compiled, you cannot switch, you cannot change. No. So that means you have to recompile by yourself. That's a nightmare in terms of uh, operational perspective, you know, to prepare new packages, deploy, run, and so on, restart, and so on, and so on. So I said, okay, let's make it easier. And we have the option uh, of um, changing what's the memory allocator used by OpenSIPS as an, um, a startup option. So basically you don't need to recompile anymore. You just need to do a an, uh, an restart. <coughs> and uh, even uh, funny, uh, because we have right now like three scenarios of using uh, memory, uh, our own memory allocator. It's for the private memory, for the shared memory, and now it's for the uh, persistent memory. So there are like three different chunks of memory. Basically, you can use different allocator for each of them. So it's not necessary to use the same one for, let's say, all of them. So you can, let's say, use regular one for the private memory and enable uh, a, an, um, a dedicated allocator for, let's say, tracing memory leaks only for shared memory. So you don't have to, let's say, compromise performance overall 
by using a uh, uh, less performant mem memory allocator just for debugging uh, purposes. So again, that's something that it's somewhere in the middle between us as developer because we need more information to trace the issue and also trying to make your life easier because we cannot simply ask, okay, you know, you recompile everything, do this and this, and then give me the data, you know. Probably 50% of the people say, you know what, beep beep off. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, the last cool thing that we did in, uh, in, uh, in 3.0 was more or less uh, something that we learned after the 2.4 when we had all this clustering uh, stuff. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it, it's really helpful to take a step back and look, you know, what you did and try to reanalyze it after it's done to see, okay, was it not, it was a good decision or not? And uh, yeah, overall it was a good decision, but uh, still there was place for improvements. And uh, we discovered that we ended up, um, you know, in terms of controlling the clustering uh, with a kind of, uh, we call them sharing tags to control, okay, who's responsible for managing data in, inside the cluster with different implementation in different modules. So what we did uh, in uh, 3.0, we unified all this. So basically there is a single way of controlling basically the cluster in terms of what node is responsible for performing what kind of operations over dialogue data, user location data, uh, presence data, dynamic routing data, dispatcher data, and everything through a single kind of uh, sharing tag. So right now, uh, there'll be a really cool uh, demo on uh, Thursday about how you can do a, uh, an uh, HA setup, a uh, high availability active backup uh, setup. Um, using clustering and with um, how you can actually do the switch between the two uh, open SIPs, the active and the backup, with a single MI command, so basically switching the roles in terms of who is the master in terms of handling data with a single uh, command. With 2.4 you have to do a bunch of them, so that's the whole idea with the unified uh, sharing tags. But again, that would be fun in the, in the demo to see and understand how it actually uh, works and uh, a bit um, um, other goodies that we had in uh, 3.0 which do not fit into the DevOps concept but still we wanted to do them because they are cool. Uh, one of them there was a SMPP uh, uh, module so basically, OpenSIPs can talk directly SMPP right now, so you can connect. Uh, for people who have no idea what SMPP is, it's the protocol used for connecting to SMS centers, so for basically for sending uh, SMSs to, uh, to the mobile operators. And uh, yeah, we can uh, do it right now directly from the, uh, from the OpenSIPs. So you can convert SIP messages, I mean SIP message as a method, uh, to SMSs and vice versa from the OpenSIP. So um, probably um, I think uh, most of the uh, SMS providers uh, do offer SMPP-based uh, uh, interconnection rather than SIP one. So right now you don't have this problem anymore because you can simply go directly through SMPP and connect to as many um, SMS providers as you want. So that's problem solved. Previous, previously you had to work with Canal or some other things, some other um, uh, softwares in order to, you know, uh, yeah, do the conversion. And yeah, um, something that we felt a need for, for a long time we have this uh, RabbitMQ support in order of sending events. But uh, when it comes to interoperability and uh, not interoperability, sorry, integration with uh, you know with platforms where you have other uh, softwares able to let's say raise events through RabbitMQ, uh, a good uh, tool is the new RabbitMQ consumer module. So right now, OpenSIPs can receive and consume events, and eventually, you know, from the script level, you can do uh, whatever you like. So that's a really handy kind of a Swiss knife tool uh, when it comes to doing uh, complex integration with other tools. Uh, I'm running out of time. Well, no, I, st I still have like four minutes. No, you're running out of time. No, I'm not. 
Um, just uh, some ideas what we want to do in 3.1. So we want to follow the line of uh, improving scripting experience. Uh, maybe a bit of um, restructuring for, for, the, for the script. Uh, uh, mainly because we want to simplify as much as possible the, let's say, deployment experience when it comes to OpenSafe. So you can do it in, uh, you know, integrated and do it with uh, automatic deployment tools. In a you know in a faster way. Um, also, uh, there was basically no time for 3.0 to do, but so we are looking into improve also the integration of uh, non-native scripts, like uh, we have right now. But it's not maybe the best approach for Python Perl uh, script integration uh, into the actual OpenSIP uh, script. Uh, we want to rework that in a in a better way. Uh, and of course, right now having the the CLI, the, the new CLI tool, we want to do uh, more cool stuff on uh, on top of that in terms of controlling and interacting uh, with uh, with OpenSIP. So that's just an idea of what should be what will be the line uh, for continuing this develop uh, uh, concept in the next uh, next uh, release. So Python integration right now exists. Uh, yes, it does. Maxim can tell you tell you more about it. Uh, it works, uh, but in my opinion, there is still a lot of uh, uh, place for improvements in terms of you know making it more handy and eventually making uh, cross triggering. I mean, to call from OpenSIP script a Python script and vice versa, or calling from the Python script eventually some OpenSIP functions and so on. So yeah, that's something that. Uh, we plan to improve. So just to end with uh, what we call the OpenSIP 3.0 effect, or let's say transition, is mainly from you know being really, really uh, how to say uh, uh, not scared, uh, I would say uh, nervous about you know operating and careful about oh I don't want to break anything and I don't want to you know have uh, my boss coming hey you stop the service for one minute and the customers are calling and you know stuff like that so switching to 3.0 you should go somewhere in in, in this area does, does that really happen to you no, no. <laughs> what's uh, what's the amendment i want to invoke that amendment you know, <laughs> for not telling you <laughs> okay so more or less uh, uh yeah so that's what we call the 3.0 uh effect so, yeah, um, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'm not sure if we have time. Yeah, we have one minute left for... Yeah, the thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a question? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions out there? Come on, people. Throw those hands up. How is it possible to smoothly move from... No, no, hold on a second. No, no. You raise your hand. <laughs> I tell you that it's okay to talk. And then you ask your question. There, there's a whole flow in that. Exactly. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> it's possible to smoothly and evenly move from the 2.4 version to the third one without any troubles and a lot of maintenance. So, like, just do something common and it creates new database with new structure. Like, uh, from the database, that's not an issue. It, uh, it's just one table, slightly different. The biggest problem is about the script and about all those function parameters. We were planning it eventually, uh, you know, a long time ago when we talked about all these changes to do some uh, magic scripts to be able to translate in terms of syntax some, uh, you know, from 2.4 to 3.0 uh, script. Uh, okay. There was no time for that. Still, it's on the on the table. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, there is a migration document. So on um, in the on the web uh, site, if you go for the 3.0 version, uh, uh, there is again a migration uh, document telling you okay what function had uh, ch uh, have changed into into the script or what you have to pay attention in terms of migrating to 3.0. And if you want to take the challenge and uh, you find out that something it's not rightly documented, feel free to, to let Call us know boss. to improve it. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Is 3.0 uh, long-term support? Which 
Uh, no, it will not be probably next 3.1 because uh, that's the first in a row and uh, there are so many radical changes into it. I'm not saying it's not stable, but we still want to evaluate what will be the impact and if we need to do like tuning changes, uh, in, uh, you know, to, to make it, you know, some to, to get to a point where you can say, yeah, that that's worthy to be an LTS. So yeah, probably 3.1 will be. Keep talking, but take a different thing. Yeah. Any other questions out here? So the, the memory allocators, not on the shared memory, but on the process memory, that can be that you say it can be reloaded or restarted. Can that happen on a reload as well, or just on? No, because that's start? that's a uh, startup option. So basically, that's a parameter that you give to OpenSips when you start it as an application. So you, it's not a reload. Uh, it's not reload impacted. I actually have a piece of question that goes with that. Um, so you had said that. That's right. Um, you had said that a piece of memory gets left behind with all this information in it, waiting for the restart. Is there like a TTL on that chunk or something? No. So what happens? Let's say if uh, you don't restart. Despite uh, your boss. Well, no, that's a, that's a, that's a memory that that's used by OpenSys by you know regular operations. So mm -hmm. if you don't restart, that's not a problem. It's actual memory used by uh, by OpenSys. Gotcha. Uh, things are a bit more complex in terms that you have options to indicate <sighs> OpenSys when it shut downs what to do if you want to have that memory persistent or not, mm -hmm. or when you load if you want to use a potential persistent chunk of memory or not. So gotcha. there you can you can control how to work with that. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you both. <laughs>